Well, good afternoon, everyone, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and uh, welcome back. And thank you very much for joining in uh, in this teaching session. I'm Nandini Sadasivam, and I'm one of the haematology consultants at Manchester Royal, and I'm also the chair for the North of England Network for Thalassemia and Inherited Rare Anemias. So these are sort of short series of teaching sessions that um, we've been doing, and we've had very good feedback, which is why I'm persevering with these short sessions around lunchtime. And um, uh, we have today uh, none other than Dr. Banu Kaya, who's going to be talking to us on management of paediatric patients with thalassemia with a focus on iron chelation therapy. Uh, for those of you who, uh, many of you would have known Dr. Kaya, but uh, a little bit about Dr. Kaya's background. Um, she's a consultant haematologist at Bart's uh, Health NHS Trust uh, in London, and she's also the honorary uh, clinical senior clinical lecturer at Bart's and the London School of Medicine and Dentistry, Queen Mary University of London. Banu led the paediatric component of the National Hemoglobinopathy Peer Review Programme and co-chaired the steering committee from 2014 to 2016. So Banu has been the UK chief investigator for a number of international clinical trials and has contributed to a number of <coughs> recent national guidelines, uh, including the monitoring and management of iron overload. So thank you very much, Banu, for attending today and doing this session. And um, we'll take questions at the end. Over to you, Banu, now. Great. Thank you, Nandini. Um, and thank you so much for the invite. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be with you um, this afternoon. Um, it, it's sad that we can't um, see each other um, in person, but here we are. At least many more people can join. And I think you're recording the sessions so people can hopefully see it in their own time. I'm going to be talking about um, management of paediatric thalassemia and the main focus is going to be on chelation therapy um, and I've got some cases right at the end to talk about some of the practical aspects um, but I thought I would start by just giving a, a very short overview of just general principles around management so talking about the diagnosis of a new patient when we might consider starting transfusions, um, what those transfusion schedules should look like, and then uh, general health maintenance and monitoring. I'm not really going to talk much about transplant and uh, future therapies, and, and this is obviously a very topical subject, but um, probably deserves um, a talk in its own right um, with all the developments that are going on. Um, so I like to um, think about the management in, in sort of three main categories. Um, so the option of cure is um, generally not a reality for the vast majority of our patients. But um, as you know, with sibling um, allo transplants and in young children with thalassemia, the outcomes are excellent. Um, and we, we, we really should proactively encourage tissue typing of siblings um, to ensure that if we've got a match, we refer for, for a consultation regarding transplant as early as possible and ideally before the age of 11. Um, it's important that we discuss other types of transplants, unrelated donor transplants, haplos at the national panel. Sometimes it's appropriate to consider those options. And then, of course, gene therapy may be changing the landscape. Um, but the vast majority of patients, the mainstay of management is about disease modification and health maintenance, um, particularly for paediatric patients. Um, so the main focus is going to be on preventing and correcting the ineffective erythropoiesis and chronic um, hemolysis, which is a feature of transfusion dependent thalassemia. And we achieve that with optimal um, and efficient transfusion therapy. Of course, with regular blood transfusions, um, we have the issue of iron overload um, and it's important we maintain neutral iron balance. And this is where uh, optimal chelation therapy comes into the equation. And all of this process requires really, really careful monitoring um, for thalassemia related problems and treatment related problems. <laughs> 
Um, for children, symptom control and the management of emergency situations isn't a huge um, problem. Um, but in adolescents and older adults, um, unfortunately, sometimes we do develop um, irreversible organ damage, which can lead to um, really severe symptomatic disease. And children, of course, with thalassemia um, do complain of chronic tiredness and, and other symptoms. And it's important we, we focus on how we might manage those symptoms. Bone disease, for example, is um, a growing problem in older adults and optimal management in child could, could really impact on those sorts of symptoms and complications in, old, in older patients. Um, compliance is a big problem, of course, um, and it's a real challenge, particularly with children. And we have to be mindful of um, the complications of all of the treatments we're considering. So we'll talk a little bit about how that applies to um, chelation therapy. So what about guidelines? Um, so uh, Nandini and I and um, a few others have been involved in uh, writing up some guidelines uh, as part of the BSH guidelines group for the monitoring and management of iron overload. And, th and this really sort of takes into account all of the, the latest um, evidence base around um, chelation therapy. Um, Nandini and I and also a few others are also looking to update the um, UKTS standards for the care, clinical care of children and adults with thalassemia. So um, hopefully in the next year uh, we will have some updated guidance. And then the TIF guidelines, which are very easily accessible um, on the web, um, have recently been updated and, and, and they, I find them um, also a very, very useful resource. Um, so how do we approach the management um, of um, a new patient? So in the UK, um, most new cases of thalassemia um, are diagnosed through the neonatal screening programme, which of course is primarily designed to pick up sickle cell disease, but most significant thalassemias will be picked up this way and referred into um, the clinic in um, within three months as per the um, screening standards. Um, so obviously the, the, the history, the clinical um, assessment, taking into account the antenatal screening results is really, really important. Um, so for blood count, reticular site count, blood film are very important. Um, markers of hemolysis are useful. And then the confirmatory um, investigations to analyse um, any um, abnormal haemoglobin or any lack of haemoglobin, which is obviously what we see with um, thalassemia. Um, at this stage, so when the child is referred to the clinic within three months, we're, we're also sending off um, the genetics to look at the beta globin mutations, which can be a very useful um, guide in predicting whether this child might have a, a severe thalassemia, which um, might um, result in the child needing long-term transfusions. But of course, the decision to transfuse is a clinical one, and we'll we'll talk about that um, in the next few slides. Um, it's important we do um, the red cell phenotype and genotype, um, and we also send off the G6PD screen because um, that could be another reason for an acute um, intermittent anemia in in um, in the early stages. At that stage, we start regular folic acid. One thing we have to be mindful of is there are some patients who have been diagnosed outside of the UK and have started treatment um, before they arrive in 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 um, in our clinics. And um, an example of this is two Syrian children, two siblings I saw a couple of weeks ago who are refugees who've recently moved to the UK. And um, we have to be mindful of um, the fact that um, diagnosis may not have been um, very early on. There may have been a delay and there may have been a delay in, in initiating treatments which could result in um, early complications. So the age of presentation, the way in which they were diagnosed is important. Um, when did they start transfusions? How um, frequently were the transfusions delivered? Were there long interruptions in treatment? 
Um, and what were the transfusion services like? I mean, is there a significant risk of transfusion and transmitted infection, for example? Um, the collation history is important. Um, accessibility of uh, collation drugs in many parts of the world is, is of, of course, a huge concern. So children may have started late um, with suboptimal dosing um, and they may not have really had access to um, the, the most appropriate uh, medication for them. And any history of complications obviously is really important. Um, we monitor the, the children um, who have been newly diagnosed uh, monthly in our outpatient clinic. Um, we're monitoring carefully um, for growth and development, assessing how they're feeding, um, whether there are any additional concerns like frequent infections, which may be a feature of failure to thrive. And then um, obviously examining and checking for any early splenomegaly, hepatomegaly. Facial bone expansion can be difficult to gauge, particularly in, in young children. And this is a technique we've been um, exploring to see if we can objectively um, measure any quantifiable changes in the facial bones. So this is a facial laser scan. Again, this is this is very much experimental with our dental colleagues. Um, the advantage of this is that um, you can perform this in very young children. The, the moment they can essentially sit for just a couple of minutes um, without moving. Um, and it's it's non-invasive and um, non-toxic, so um, easily, easily done. Um, so this project was really looking at annual scans to see if we can detect um, any subtle changes. So the decision to transfuse is a clinical one. Um, so we're looking at all of those factors and we're bringing that together with the hematological um, laboratory parameters. And generally, um, we have a threshold of 70 grams per litre as, as our lower limit um, to consider transfusion. But we're taking into account, you know, all of those other aspects in the history, failure to thrive, any organomegaly, anything that might suggest that there is medullary or extramedullary hematopoiesis and any bone changes. Um, that sort of sounds straightforward, but actually sometimes it's really challenging because um, sometimes children um, don't fit into an obvious category. So kind of deciding whether this child is, you know, clearly transfusion dependent or, you know, do they have more of a non-transfusion dependent thalassemia phenotype? Um, and, that, and, that, and that's why it's important to, you know, very carefully monitor in, in the clinic um, to see how they're getting on. Um, so distinguishing non-transfusion dependent thalassemia from transfusion dependent thalassemia is, is a tricky one. Sometimes it's very straightforward. Um, the genetics, like I say, can be a helpful guide. Um, in our um, cohort in East London, we have a relatively large group of um, haemoglobin E beta thalassemia. And um, some of these patients can have a very severe phenotype needing transfusions um, really from a young age, and others are, are, are pretty well. Um, but it's, it's really important that we um, are mindful of um, the cases that are borderline. And you have to be aware that sometimes a patient who starts transfusions from a young age, and we, you know, we call that a thalassemia major, that's that sounds, you know, that's a severe condition. But um, they may be, you know, very healthy um, in contrast to somebody who hasn't started transfusions, but, you know, has many complications. Um, they have a large spleen, um, they're running a moderate anemia. Um, they have facial bone changes um, and then longer term, actually, um, then there may be more, more comorbidities with non-transfusion dependent thalassemia than, um, than somebody who was transfused from a young age who was appropriately collated and managed well. So when we're thinking about um, complications in thalassemia, um, it's sensible to think about what might be specifically disease related and what might be treatment related. So 
Disease related is all of those factors um, that arise as a result of ineffective erythropoiesis and chronic hemolysis and chronic anemia. So aptosplenomegaly, extramedullary hematopoietic um, pseudotumors, which can cause cord compression sometimes um, or other compression effects like pain. Biliary complications from the chronic hemolysis um, resulting in gallstones. Um, venous thromboembolism and silent cerebral ischemia, particularly in splenectomized patients with non transfusion dependent thalassemia. Cardiac dysfunction as a result of anemia. And then bone disease because of the complex dynamics of um, medullary and extramedullary hematopoiesis. Um, and um, abnormal bone turnover, pulmonary hypertension, again related to chronic hemolysis. And then with treatment related complications, well, of course, we're very, very mild, mindful of iron toxicity, iron overload related cardiac complications, liver disease and endocrinopathy. Um, splenectomy um, may and does increase the risk of sepsis and um, also increases the risk of other complications like pulmonary hypertension and VTE. And then chelation toxicity. Um, chelation can result in significant um, toxicity, um, which can be dose limiting um, and sometimes life threatening. Hello. So optimal transfusion therapy. Um, so pre-transfusion targets of 95 to 100, 105 grams per litre. Um, so this sort of threshold yeah. pre-transfusion generally requires yeah. most patients to have transfusions every three to four weeks. Um, there may be the odd patient who requires um, a little bit more of an individualized regimen. And we have to take into account other comorbidities. So, for example, if there are features of quite marked medullary hematopoiesis, keeping that target um, higher is a, a sensible plan. Um, and certainly if you're starting to get these pseudo tumors causing compression effects, you want to suppress that more. So you may need to increase the transfusion target. Older patients who develop heart disease may also benefit from a higher haemoglobin. So this is the transfusion algorithm we use um, within our network. Um, so it's straightforward in the sense that we're looking at the pre-transfusion haemoglobin and then we're prescribing in mils per kilogram based on that and then making a decision about whether they come back at the standard schedule, let's say four weekly, or whether we need to bring them back earlier or later. And um, this algorithm we looked at and compared with your sort of standard calculation for transfusion in children. And we found that although the, the, the transfusion requirement was slightly higher, um, actually we were able to achieve the um, required pre-transfusion targets um, better in most cases. Um, so again, I'd be interested to um, hear about um, your practice um, and targets, um, but this is something that um, our juniors have certainly find a little bit easier as well um, when prescribing. So here are some questions. Um, so we've got a child who started on regular blood transfusions and we know that they will develop iron loading. Um, but when when does it start and when should you start chelation? Also, can the iron be sequestered before organ dysfunction occurs? Because we know if you're if you start to build up iron, um, eventually it will lead to problems. Um, and what about growth in particular? And this is a particular challenge, of course, for children. Can all of these complications be prevented with good chelation? Um, how much of the possible damage is reversible? Um, are there some aspects that can be irreversible? Um, so this is some data um, from quite a few years ago, and um, it looks at different um, subgroups of children um, who have congenital transfusion dependent anemia. So we have transfusion dependent thalassemia, but also other conditions like CDA uh, and diamond black anemia. And what um, what this illustrates is that um, 
even in very young children. So the, the, this line here, which marks um, the age of 3.5 years, you can see that um, a significant proportion of children here, so these are young children, um, have significant iron loading in the liver, um, also in the pancreas and um, rarely also in the in the heart. But particularly with the liver, you can see um, with transfusion dependent thalassemia, this is a problem. Um, it's it's a it's even more of a problem if you have no erythropoiesis. So in conditions like diamond black fan anemia, they do tend to load much more rapidly. Um, so thalassemia is also significantly iron loading in contrast to conditions like um, sickle cell. So the background disease is is important, but even very young children can develop very early severe iron loading in the liver. What about the heart? Um, so this is um, a cohort of children. Um, these were Chinese children, and these are all transfusion dependent thalassemia patients. And the median age here is about nine, so relatively young children. So again, this line here depicts um, a T cardiac T2 star MRI scan of 20. So anything under 20 um, demonstrates um, significant iron loading in the heart. And um, this group here, you can see, have iron loading in the heart, but preserved ejection fraction. But this small cohort here, they have significant iron loading in the heart, which is now also causing cardiac dysfunction. So very, very worrying early iron loading in the heart, even in very young children. But what we know from various cohort studies is that um, in young children, if you chelate them well, the risk of developing cardiac iron loading is pretty small. Um, so that's really, really positive. And um, well, what about growth? Um, hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism is a significant concern. Um, the pituitary gland is, is very sensitive to accumulating very high levels of iron um, you know, in the first decade. So we have to be really, really careful. Um, the problem, though, is how do we assess that? Um, we can't easily measure pituitary gonadal function before puberty, um, but we're saying that this damage might happen before the age of 10. We know that um, once you load iron into the pituitary, eventually um, you start um, destroying tissue and that causes the pituitary um, to lose volume. And you can measure that um, by scans. And there has been some um, data looking at um, using, um, oops, sorry, I'm just gonna go here, um, using MRI techniques also to, um, measure pituitary iron, but these haven't been sort of particularly validated, but there is concordance with liver iron. So we use the liver iron really to, to use as a guide for pituitary iron. So here you can see that in children um, who are pre-pubertal um, and those children post-pubertal who had evidence of hypogonadism and didn't, um, they, they, there were definitely differences in the R2 um, Z scores by um, MR imaging. And um, when you looked at volume loss, again, there was some correlation. So the problem is, is by the time you've got volume loss, you've got irreversible damage. So that's a real concern. Um, so um, We've been able to um, answer some of these questions. So we know that iron loading can start very early on in some children. We know that there are some risk factors. So the underlying condition is important, but very, very importantly, the collation history. How compliant have they been? Are they on the right drug? Is that has has that drug been efficacious? We know that iron can be sequestered before organ damage um, occurs. And that, again, depends on the iron loading, unloading kinetics. So we know that um, mostly the iron starts loading into the liver and then it moves once it's saturated 
the iron stores in the liver, it moves to extra hepatic organs, so pituitary, pancreas and heart. Um, so this, this pattern can sometimes vary, particularly in heavily um, collated um, older children, um, where this pattern sort of, it's, you know, you can have some children with very high um, iron loading in the heart, but actually you've managed to de-iron the liver pretty well. And can this be prevented with, with good collation? So generally, yes, but how much is reversible? So we know um, that cardiac iron loading is um, um, really um, very much reversible. Liver iron loading is also reversible. However, we have to be mindful if you get to the stage of cirrhosis where it's caused damage, that may be more tricky, although there is some evidence now that maybe even that is reversible. Um, there's a bit of debate about um, pituitary um, damage um, and some case reports saying with very, very good collation, you might be able to reverse this, but it, it, this is pretty unusual. So most children who develop pituitary problems um, will mostly need hormone replacement therapy long term. Okay. I'm just going to... Go back. So the purpose of collation therapy is really twofold. Firstly, to bind the iron and to excrete the iron chelate complex to prevent the iron accumulating in the first place. Um, and then importantly, to avoid um, any non-transferrin bound iron particularly labile plasma iron and labile cellular iron, which is the toxic iron that, that leads to free radical mediated damage to organs. But we have to be mindful of the risk of toxicity and how this might impact um, quality of life, particularly with the challenges of complying with this treatment longer term. Um, but we know that this will improve the complication free and overall survival. So which drugs can, can we use? Um, so all of these drugs are licensed as monotherapies um, and um, in thalassemia, particularly in younger children, so I'll just bring up uh, this slide. Um, in younger children, um, our first line therapy um, with thalassemia, particularly as most children need to start transfusions before the um, age of um, two, we go for deferoxamine. Um, our second line is um, deferacerox, and those children who are um, over the age of, of two, generally we we can start with um, extra deferacerox as well. Sorry, I'm going backwards and forwards a little bit because my slides are a little bit out of sync. Um, but um, we've um, also highlighted that there are circumstances where monotherapy may not be the answer. Um, so in the BSH guidelines in particular, we've looked at the role of combination therapy. The evidence base in children is, is not huge, but it is evolving. Um, so again, at the end, I've got some case studies um, describing how we've used uh, combination therapy. So um, when should you start chelation therapy? So we know that iron loading can happen early, but we also know that iron chelation can be toxic. So we've got most of this evidence from using deferoxamine um, for many, many years. So we know that if you start deferoxamine when you've got low iron burden, um, it will impact growth and development because it causes um, a bone dysplasia, particularly vertebral bone dysplasia. Um, so vertebral height is um, gets gets shortened, so you end up with um, a disproportionately short trunk. Um, so the sitting height is disproportionate to the standing height. It can also cause ocular um, toxicity and sensory neural hearing impairment. So we generally start when um, children have had regular blood transfusions, which have exceeded 100 mils per kg per year, or if the ferritin goes above 1,000 micrograms per litre. 
The other thing we look at is the transfer and saturation. So when we're monitoring the child uh, monthly, we also send off the trans transfer and saturation. And this seems to correspond well with the timing um, with our other markers. Um, so transfer and saturation over 90% is a good um, threshold for starting collation therapy. We use this um, Excel spreadsheet to record our transfusion volumes because then it's quite easy to calculate out exactly what we've used over the course of the year and whether this is changing over time. Um, and we also record um, data on the collation drugs we're using and any of the monitoring bloods that might be necessary. So for um, for deferoprane, for example, because of the risk of agranulocytosis, we'll be monitoring um, the full blood count and the neutrophil count in particular. For X-Jade, for deferocerox, we're going to be looking at renal function and liver function. Uh, I guess also for, for deferoprane, liver function is important. So young children who start chelation mostly, and these are going to be young children before the age of two, um, we'll be starting um, deferoxamine um, and this is um, a, um, a syringe driver we use, the Graysby pump, um, which parents um, use at home. Um, so they have a period of um, education to ensure um, they're competent in, in delivering this. So they make up the solution. This is a, a small volume solution so that um, we're not um, going to cause problems, infusion problems in a young child. So we want the concentration really not to be above 10%. And this obviously isn't the easiest thing to comply with. So it takes a lot of work from our nursing team to work with our families to ensure this is done uh, well. So my slides seem to Oh, here we go. Um, in older children, we can use the disposable infusers. And of course, I think you will know, and in London, we've got a problem. I think you've probably got a problem in um, the north as well around availability of different um, infusers. And, um, you know, this is this is a real issue because some of the newer ones are quite bulky and not not easy to manage. Um, so this is a graph showing deferoxamine toxicity. So um, you can see that they're dropping off their growth chart and the classical um, lesions. Um, this is this is in um, the knee, but typically um, we might be seeing some early changes when we're monitoring the sitting and standing height. Um, so in terms of overall principles, we're going to be starting collation and then there's going to be a very careful process of um, monitoring. Um, so this is going to be continuous and dynamic. Um, it's going to involve looking at transfusion usage, compliance, adherence, complications, and really, really important that we make optimal dose adjustments. And these are the targets we're trying to achieve. So a serum ferritin of between 500 and 1,000 the liver iron concentration, ideally less than seven. And so for most of our children, we'll be doing the first scan when they can tolerate a scan without a general anaesthetic or sedation. So average is about age six, seven. Um, and then generally over the age of eight, we start doing myocardial T2 stars. So um, monitoring checking you've achieved your satisfactory haemoglobin, checking for uh, ineffective erythropoiesis, medullary or extramedullary, and how is this impacting on quality of life? Collation, compliance and toxicity, um, assessing storage iron um, and assessing organ function. And the special monitoring in particular for children is, of course, the growth and development. Um, so joint clinics with endocrine colleagues are really important to, to do this proactively. So how do we monitor iron overload? Um, so like I said, um, in um, a, a child who's recently started on transfusions, the transfusion history will be important and can be very useful in deciding on your collation. Um, serum ferritin trends are really, really important. Um, and we know that high levels um, are um, linked with poor outcomes in transfusion dependent thalassemia. 
Um, in heavily treated patients, though, the serum ferritin trend can be a bit discordant with the liver iron concentration. So um, it's really important we don't just use the ferritin to make adjustments for chelation therapy. And then, of course, MR imaging, which has really transformed the way in which we can uh, monitor and manage um, optimal iron chelation therapy. And so th this was the um, this is in the um, guidelines which we'll be um, uh, reviewing. So the decisions around what you choose when are not always straightforward. Um, so I'm going to sort of illustrate that with some cases at the end. So when do we use combination therapy? So generally, for most children, monotherapy is is fine, um, but sometimes it's not sufficient. Um, and the particular scenarios are when um, the drug that you're using as monotherapy is either causing toxicity or there is, there's a compliance issue. And sometimes um, you might need intensification and you might want to be using um, the potential of two drugs to work synergistically in um, removing the iron. But of course, using two drugs is going to also impact on compliance. So you have to be mindful of those challenges. So in terms of practical aspects, um, important we always individualise care. Um, with children, um, one of the things we have to be mindful of is that we avoid undercalating because um, children are continuing to grow, make sure we're keeping up with their growth, um, checking that transfusion rates aren't changing and then uh, monitoring and assessing outcomes. Um, Overcalation is sometimes a problem, of course. Um, with defroxamine, we've got evidence of that. We don't have so much evidence with X-Jade and deferoprone around toxicity with low iron burden, but of course, iron is a really important mineral in um, growth and development. So potentially, if you're chelating, um, you may be causing harm. Um, and then working with the fam families um, to um, address adherence. And adherence is the biggest problem because these collators do work, they're efficacious, um, but it's not easy adhering to these lifelong treatments. So a holistic ap approach, um, using your multidisciplinary team to individualise um, um, for the needs of the patient is really um, important. And from a young age, we try to instill a degree of independence and self-care. And obviously with babies, you really have to work so hard with parents. Um, to ensure they understand the importance of this. Um, but very early on, we try to get children involved in managing their medication themselves. Um, but things like mentoring, role models, expert patient programmes can be really helpful. Um, psychology support, education, all of these things um, can really, really help. Um, and I think it's important that health professionals are, you know, are aware, you know, often when we ask the patient, um, are you taking your medication? Nine out of 10 cases, it's yes, I'm taking it. But, you know, we know that that's not always the case. So an open dialogue, which takes time, it involves, you know, trust. Um, and, you know, that's why, you know, knowing these families and managing them over many, many years um, really makes a difference. Um, so active engagement, using the multidisciplinary team, really important. So I'm going to go on to my cases. So the, the first, so actually I've got three sets of siblings um, with quite differing um, treatment um, regimens. And then I've got um, just a sort of a random patient at the end. So these are two siblings. They have the same genetics. So this is the older sibling. Um, so both of these um, girls started um, defaroxamine. They started transfusions before the age of one, um, around about the age of about four months, and went on to um, defaroxamine um, before the age of two. Um, so when the, the older sibling had her first um, R2 um, berry scan, you can see that she was heavily iron loaded. Um, so um, we worked with the family to ensure that they were managing the collation well and you know she made excellent progress. Um, now when we were monitoring her we noticed that um, there were 
some abnormalities with her sitting and standing height. So she had actually started to develop deferoxamine related vertebral dysplasia. Um, so we have to be really careful. Um, and she was, you know, you can see here there was a rapid drop and she was, you know, had pretty low iron loading. So she was switched to x -Jade. However, she developed a transaminitis with um, x -Jade. Hold on for one second. Um, so um, we felt she might benefit from going on to deferoprone. And um, as she got older and she achieved her peak bone mass and her peak height, um, we decided to reintroduce um, deferoxamine and that really made a difference. So using this combination therapy, now it is back on the way down and she's making good progress. Right, this is um, her sibling. Um, so this is the younger of the two siblings. Um, so this young lady also had relatively high iron loading when she had her first scan. Um, but she seemed to be doing really well with um, Desferol. We were careful not to um, uh, increase her dose really above 35 milligrams per kilogram um, to avoid toxicity. Um, but she started to get fed up and wanted to switch to x -Jade. Um And as you can see here, this is a typical problem we see in the older adolescents where um, you know, th th they do get a little bit rebellious um, and fed up. Um, and this is a really worrying concern in, in, in their treatment journey because this is going to cause problems. So with x she was having um, problems with toxicity. Compliance was also an issue. Um, so she was switched back to Desperol and um, because things were really off the scale, um, by this stage, um, she also went on to combination therapy of Dasperol and Deferoxamine. This is sort of intensification now of treatment because we're going to end up with concerning um, um, iron loading related problems. Thankfully, both sisters do not have iron loading in, in the um, heart, but the sibling two um, hadn't started menstruating. So um, we are concerned about her gonadal function um, and pituitary function. So this is a young girl who had, for many years had also been on um, defaroxamine. Um, and and you, you can see here that she's doing very, very well. And you might argue, well, why did you, why did you feel you had to introduce um, another another agent when she was doing so well. Um, the problem was that we got to about here, so um, a liver iron concentration of 7.1, and she was starting to get, get fed up with the frequency of her desferol infusions. So um, the compromise was, well, let's try um, a little bit of X-Jade with your, with your desferol and see how, how you get on. Um, and she found that regimen worked very well. She didn't actually want to go up on her dose of x which would be the other option, and to have her on monotherapy. Um, so she was very happy, and parents were very happy with this schedule, and she will actually be going for a transplant um, this year. She's got a sibling donor. In contrast, this is her brother, her younger brother. So he hasn't had an R2 yet, um, because... Um, we tend to do these scans when they're able to have them without sedation. So you can see the ferritin trend is upward here. He started with Dasferol. Parents were struggling um, to manage Dasferol for him. So for a very short while, he had X-Jade, but also had a transaminitis. Um, so switched back to Dasferol. They were really trying to persevere. Uh, ferritin trend was still upward. So again, he went on combination therapy with deferoprone um, and deferoxamine. And we've sort of plateaued here. Uh, we're hoping this is going to be a downward trend and he will be having an R2 soon. And I hope uh, we'll see an improvement there. This is a 10-year-old boy who um, 
he started transfusions um, relatively later, so he ended up actually starting his um, collation with X-Jade. Um, and unfortunately, we weren't able to, to dose escalate um, because he was also having toxicity. Um, parents weren't keen to switch him to um, deferoxamine, so he switched to deferoprene monotherapy. Sadly, that wasn't really doing much. I mean, we didn't see an increase in his liver iron loading, but um, we were certainly not able to shift what had been stored. And so for him, again, we um, managed to get parents to agree to um, combination therapy with um, deferoxamine. And you can see a beautiful downward trend here. So he has now stopped the deferoxamine because he, you know, he was struggling, parents are struggling, so he's on deferoprone monotherapy. This is his older sister who um, who also started X-Jade as monotherapy and she's done really well. She was able to tolerate her medication beautifully with no toxicity and you can see this is like a perfect result. Um, so this is my last case. So this is a 17 year old um, who was diagnosed in the Philippines and um, moved to the UK. Um, when he was about seven or eight, but he'd um, already had a splenectomy um, in the Philippines. The transfusion schedules were probably not um, optimal and he he didn't have um, access to collation from um, from an, an early age. But sadly, when he started treatment, he had every complication you can imagine. So with defroxamine, he had um, Klebsiella sepsis and um, Klebsiella liver abscess. Um, which was a concern, so this is a recognised um, complication. With deferoprone, he had agranulocytosis. And with defarocerox, with X-Jade, he had renal tubular acidosis and peptic ulcer disease. He has, um, he, he didn't have any, he was, an, he was an only child, didn't have any um, sibling donors. And he was really getting fed up and compliance wasn't, wasn't great. Um, so the problem here is that um, he went on to combination therapy with um, deferoxamine and X-Jade, low dose X-Jade because of the toxicity previously, and we tried to get him on a decent dose of um, deferoxamine. And his liver iron loading, you can see here, is not too bad at all, but his um, myocardial T2 star is really worrying, so less than 10. Um, so then he goes on to intensification with IV continuous desferol, defroxamine, um, which was given through a port. Um, but he's also starting to develop some um, cardiac impairment now, which is a real, real worry. But the serum tr ferritin trend is beautifully downward. Um, but you can see here with this intensification, we're really improving the liver iron loading, but it takes much, much longer to impact the heart and the iron loading in the heart. So he gets fed up and he just wants to go back to a normal regimen, subcut def defroxamine and X-Jade. Um, but actually what we did with him in the end was that we switched him to um, a low dose of deferoprene because generally um, the recommendation is that you don't re-challenge um, a person who has had a granulocytosis with deferoprone again because um, they may have the same problem which obviously can lead to life um, life threatening sepsis um, but actually we started on on a small dose and gradually gradually increased and he's he's done well and that over um, a couple of years has um, made um, really improved his iron loading in his heart um, so that's it. Thank you, Vanna. That was such an excellent talk um, on a comprehensive review on paediatric thalassemia and uh, eye inhalation management.
I'll start with the very first question that I have. And again, this has come through our own network. What is your experience or advice about using the Ferrisy rocks in under two year roles, Banu? It's it's an interesting one. Um, yeah, we have this question all the all the time. Um, sometimes we come across cases in our network where, where it's been started um, up front um, before the age of two, and and sometimes it's um, because of not just not being aware of the fact that it's not not licensed, um, rather than necessarily sort of thinking well actually um, the parents are not wanting deferoxamine. Um, and this is going to be a practical solution. So I think it's a tricky one. We have used it. My worry with using it up front is that sometimes you come across scenarios where you're um, you're you're trying to dose escalate with with X Jade. Um, and the, the the most common problem we see is a recurrent transaminitis. So renal toxicity is, you know, relatively common in a third of patients, but transaminitis, again, very, very variable. And, and sometimes you can't dose escalate. When you then have the conversation about at that stage, switching them to Desferol, it becomes even more of a, a perception that this is going to be a horrendous burden. And yes, it, it is a burden, but it's almost like that sort of psychological aspect that if you started on Desferol, and actually many families manage manage well it's not easy but they manage well going the other way can be even more challenging yeah. so i guess um, i don't think there's a right or wrong about this and there probably is a role sometimes um, um you know using it off license but i think we just have to be we just have to be mindful of the fact that this is a chronic condition and at different aspects of the timeline there may be a time when you really have to chop and change. Um, and sometimes patients, you know, are exposed to all three collators at some stage. Yeah. Yeah. OK, very helpful. It, it keeps coming back on my network MDT from time, mm -hmm. time to time. I think I had Indus had put her hand up, but she's taken it down. Got a uh, it's OK, I was going to type, but I can talk now. Yeah. Uh, my question was, you know, in your last case uh, where you had um, obvious cardiac symptoms and um, investigational evidence, uh, why not prioritize deferiprone in addition to the desferioxamine rather than defrocyrox? Yeah, so he, he had um, uh, he had used um, deferiprone, but he developed an agranulocytosis. So, um, so the the general kind of um, well certainly the manufacturer's recommendation is that if you've had a granulocytosis, don't yeah. rechallenge. But we did end up using um, deferiprone in the end at very small doses and building up, um, and he was fine. He was fine. So he's unfortunate in that he had every complication with all three collators. So I think it was a pragmatic one, really. Well, you know we have to use something and absolutely if he hadn't had any granulocytosis that that's absolutely the thing to use with IV desferol you know when you when you've got them on the 24 7 back to back deferoxamine you've got to introduce some deferoprone and it takes just a very very long time to to DI on the heart what sort of doses were you using Banu so when with with, with a granulocytosis when you rechallenged this boy then so I think we used um, roughly around 50 milligrams per kilogram. Yeah. Um, but we worked up to 75. I'm not sure if we managed to get up to 100 milligrams per kg. But you know, ideally, you want to get to 100 milligrams per kilogram if you've got that degree of iron yeah. loading in the heart with cardiac impairment. And sadly, you know, this is a problem we see in some of the teenagers and the young adults it's a really challenging time in their in their lives and um you know within all of our networks there are sadly um hopefully not as often as there used to be but you know there are very sad situations of people yeah. dying you know um in in early adult life that's a shame actually with, with all shame. the treatment that we have these days but um, yeah 
Absolutely. So we've Thank got you. a question there with, uh, is it Kirsten Lund from Imperial? Do you do fast annual fasting glucose levels in your patients and from what age? Hi, Kirsten. Um, yes, we, 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 I say we used to have a joint um, endocrine clinic. Um, at the moment, it's on hold because of staffing issues um, in our endocrine clinic. But we, we essentially start seeing children um, in that clinic to specifically focus on growth and endocrine function from the age of, of 10. Um, if there's a family history of um, diabetes or if we're concerned about um, iron loading, then we'd start earlier um, around eight. But that's the sort of general age. Um, and um, with children on just general transfusion um, regimens, um, annually in January, we do a sort of a batch of all um, endocrine investigations um, and we add sort of um, vitamin D to that as well. So that often starts a little bit earlier um, and some children need a glucose tolerance test as well. Um, so I think someone's asking about ascorbic acid with cardiac. Um, so ascorbic acid we use with um, with with any use of um, deferoxamine. Um, so I guess you're you're maybe talking about the case where you've got the twenty four seven back to back infusion, and what time would you use ascorbic acid? Um, again, the evidence base for this is is not huge, but you know, any time of the day, once daily regimen uh, is is sensible, um, as as it may help to facilitate that sort of additional iron um, excretion. Um, but with all of the um, with children on monotherapy with deferoxamine or or on combination therapy with Defroxamine. Um, yeah, we do, we do use ascorbic acid. Brilliant. So we've got Katie Stevenson um, who's asked, is there an option of starting very low doses of chelation from first transfusion with rigorous monitoring? And do you give dietary advice? So yeah, that's 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 a good question. Um, all been really, really fantastic questions. Um, so th this is um this is an interesting one. Um, there has been a, a a fair bit of debate about using potentially a low dose of X jade um, up front. Um, the difficulty there is that um, it's quite difficult in young children um, evaluating iron loading. So you obviously you've got the ferritin trend, which is useful. But um, iron, iron is also going to be really, really important for um, neurocognitive development. So I think it's difficult um, and there is no data. I think we would probably need good clinical data to say that it's safe um, to do that. Um, because I think sensitivities, again, can be pretty variable. Um, so, I mean, you could, you know, you could argue, well, you know, seven milligrams per kilogram. Generally, if you've got them on, you know, a proper transfusion regimen, usually that's not effective to 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 induce negative iron balance. But, you know, in theory, you might argue it might just be enough to cause neutral iron balance. I'm not sure we've got that data yet. Um, in terms of dietary advice, um, not hugely, because I, I, my, my personal view is that in um, transfusion dependent thalassemia, it's not going to make a huge difference. The thing that's going to make a difference is the collation. And I guess if you're giving, if you're, if you're taking the focus away from collation to dietary advice, I think that that might cause a degree of confusion for families. Um, there may be a role for that, and, and, and sometimes there is with non-transfusion dependent thalassemia where dietary iron um, may, may, you know, may impact on iron loading. And, and we, of course, use um, X-Jade at low dose um, for non-transfusion dependent thalassemia as well. Um, someone's saying, what age do you start scanning? Um, with MRI techniques. So 
um, in our practice, um, we start um, scanning. So their first ferry scan, um, usually around the age of seven, six or seven. So essentially when they're able to tolerate an MRI scan, you know, with some play therapy, um, but without us having to sedate them. So, you know, this is this is something that I think we we probably ought to review. Certainly the Italians um, sedate them and get a scan done much, much earlier. Um, if we're going for transplant, um, they will have a scan um, and usually, you know, a biopsy, liver biopsy um, under sedation or anaesthetic because, you know, that evaluation is particularly important. Um, so I think there may be some children where, you know, we've been worried and, you know, like the cases I showed you on their first scan, you know, they've got worryingly high iron loading. So obviously something's sort of gone wrong. So if we had been monitoring earlier, you know, we, we, we would have picked that up potentially. Um, so, yeah, I think there is a role. Um, we are in discussions with our um, radiology departments to look at, you know, in select cases where it may be appropriate to sedate. Um, and I think, I think, yeah, we've got to be flexible about that. Yeah, brilliant. Hi, Sabiha. I think you're asking about sitting and standing heights. Do you measure routinely for death roll? Yeah, yes, we yes, we do. Um, the thing with sitting and standing heights is they've got to be done properly. Um, so um, we've got in um, on on one level, on one side of um, the clinic, we've got the haematology clinic. On the other side, we've got the endocrine. Um, and you can get observations done on both sides. Um, but the endocrine team preferentially like patients to move into their section because their team know how to do um, these measurements properly. So I think it's important, um, but it's important that it's done well so that you can sort of properly interpret um, the results. So yes, yes, we do. Um, and yes, I, I wish we could get back to our joint clinic, but we've got, you know, like I say, a bit of an interruption at the moment, but it just makes such a difference doing sitting together with our endocrine colleagues and just sort of evaluating the patient together. Brilliant. So we've got a few more questions coming through. Um, oh, can't read this now. Um, is there a ferritin level or indicators at which you would consider sedating a child under six for MRI scans? Um, yeah, so yeah, this is this is a tricky one. In um, in a child who hasn't had heavy collation, so you know, your average young child, the ferritin trend is 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 you know, it's a good indicator. So I wouldn't necessarily say that there is like a particular threshold as such. Um, I think it probably very much depends on um, whether you can see that 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 sort of plateauing or whether it's just continuing to to increase. Um, and I think if if we if we saw um, a situation where it was it was going up and up and up. I think the first thing we would do is to think about changing the, the collation and trying to understand, you know, what it is that's influencing this ferritin. Um, so it's really difficult for me to sort of say an exact ferritin level. I think it sort of takes into account all of those factors. Um, but I guess we just have to be mindful of risks and benefits with sedation as well. I mean, it's not it's not probably as complicated as 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 a child of sickle cell, um, but yeah, it was all of the sort of practical aspects of getting it done. And obviously, COVID and the pandemic has really messed all of that up. I mean, even getting a normal scan in a timely fashion is a real headache. Let alone one um, on a, on the sedation a GA list. Yeah, but the guidance does flag up to consider um, if you're worried. Um, yeah, yeah. At any point, trigger an earlier scan. So yeah, that's, I think it's a judgment, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, um, some, 
Mar Miriam Diaz. I'm now calculating the ratio of uh, rate of iron loading for my patients for little ones because of significant changes in weight. Yes. In the first 18 to 24 months, I find it tricky to do this calculation and interpret results. What's your experience? So th those um, Excel spreadsheets um, are quite, quite useful. Um, but they're useful in the sense that they're useful when you're comparing um, and monitoring trends. Um, so again, you know, th there's a lot of data in, in the literature around um, a threshold for iron loading, and that can sort of give you, a, you know, a reasonable estimate, particularly in a, um, a child who hasn't started on collation. It's a bit more tricky once they go on to collation and particularly those who are heavily iron collated and you've chopped and changed the different regimens that influences the iron loading and unloading kinetics so that sort of complicates things but i guess in your case where you're talking about the um, a young child 18 to, to 24 um we we probably ought to do it a bit more proactively i think we probably don't. It sounds like you're doing, you're being very meticulous. Um, we're probably looking more at the trends and just looking at the, at the annual results rather than um, sort of month by month. Um, but, yeah, but yeah, I guess, yeah, it's, it probably hasn't influenced our decision making hugely, more probably just the overall trend um, and fine adjustments to um, collation based on um ferritin in the early first sort of 18 months um i would say yeah i suppose it's, it's a changing isn't it the, the baby's growing and putting on weight uh, which is slightly different in adults which are they've kind of finished their growth and their transfusion rates are a bit more steady so we can use the rate to adjust the doses with the children they're they're continuously growing um it is a bit tricky, I think, with the rate of iron yeah, loading. It's pretty labour intensive as well yeah. with nursing and medical. You know, you really have to make very proactive, dynamic dose adjustments yeah. um, in, in children, which obviously increases everyone's workload. Yeah. That's so, so important. OK, brilliant. Any final questions for Dr Kaya? I take that as a no. If not, we'll end today's session. And I think we've got um, the next two monthly session on transfusion in rare anemia and another one in July in fertility and pregnancy. We will be sending some um, information out, but otherwise, uh, thank you very much, Banu, for today, um, for, for the session. And it was amazingly helpful uh, and useful session. So thanks very, very much. Thank you so much. Thanks for the invite and thank you for all the amazing questions and lots of um, really good interaction. Yes. Have See a lovely weekend, everyone. Bye now. Take care. Bye. Thank you.